What's up? Alexander here with Date Psychology. So, today, Chapter 6 in the Oxford Handbook of Evolutionary Psychology and Romantic Relationships, Human Intersexual Courtship. Let's go on now. Next slide. This is what we're looking at here. Title of the chapter by the same name, Human Intersexual Courtship. Ignore the heading there, Hormonal Mechanisms Partnership Formation, last video. This one, Human Intersexual Courtship. So, yeah, Oxford Handbook, Evolutionary Psychology, Romantic Relationships. Let's go on now to the first slide. What do we know? What are courtship behaviors? How should we interpret them, right? These are adaptations to signal mate availability, mating desire, uh, behavioral traits, psychological traits, physical traits that indicate, hey, I'm a desirable mate and I would like to be with you. I would like to engage in some mating behavior, right? So we see this across all kinds of different animals, right? They have to show that they're sexually interested, sexually receptive, that kind of a thing. Fireflies do their little dance with their butts, right? Hissing cockroaches hiss at each other. Birds, you know, have amazing mating displays. Dancing, singing for one another, that kind of a thing. In humans, we're going to focus on that here, right? Because that's kind of what we do. But lots of different things. First thing we can look at is facial ornamentation. This is going to be a theme throughout this video, okay? The traits that human beings signal and enhance and communicate, right? Courtship behaviors reflect traits that have evolved to signal mating uh, quality, so to speak, in individuals, right? So... We know facial attractiveness, very important for mate selection, so we also know, for example, that facial ornamentation should be very important for signaling attractiveness, availability, that kind of a thing. What's an example of that that we see here? Cosmetic makeup, right? Makeup, that kind of a thing, particularly in women. Very long historical use of this, you know, goes back pretty much in the historical record as far as we know. And makeup is often designed, in most cases, to enhance Physical traits that are associated with attractiveness and health, okay? So, smooth skin, for example, associated with youth. What do people put on? I guess uh, cover-up or whatever it's called, foundation that creates smoothness. I don't know. I can't say I wear a lot of makeup myself. But women would know about that. Things that enhance redness or vascularity, right? Or, for example, lipstick in women. Uh, signaling, perhaps, uh, arousal, that kind of a thing. You know, vasculature increases vasodilation associated with arousal. That kind of a thing. I know Jordan Peterson famously got in trouble a long time ago because he dared to say women wear lipstick to enhance their sexual appeal because it, it signals arousal or something to that effect. I mean, yeah, he was run, he was not wrong. That's that's true. That's what's going on there. Not that people don't enhance their beauty because they want to feel good about themselves or these other things, but like that's probably where these things come from. So what else do we know? Women more than men, they engage in kind of this cosmetic enhancement of the face. And this is an important theme we're going to see throughout all of these. I want you to keep in the back of your mind. The kind of competition, and we talked about this in the past videos, as well as the kind of self-enhancement that men and women engage in, reflects the desires of the opposite sex. So we know men care more about facial attractiveness than women do. Therefore, we see women engage in more behaviors to enhance their facial attractiveness in ways that are attractive to men, right? What do men do? Well, let's go on to the next slide and see here. Male upper body musculature. What do we know about that? Male upper body strength explains most of the variance in women's perceptions of male bodily attractiveness, right? I've covered this same paper and videos really early on in this channel, but it's out there, okay? So given that, how should we expect men to behave and what do we actually see, right? Men go to many more lengths to enhance muscularity, particularly upper body muscularity, than women do, right? Gym memberships, Many more men than women. Steroid use, mostly a male problem, right? So also specific behaviors, gestures that men engage in to enhance perceptions of attractiveness, right? So flexing muscles, taking up space with like chest expansion, that kind of a thing. The postures that men use when they speak to women and that kind of a thing. Expanding the chest, taking up space. What do we have here? Man spreading, right? Is he signaling his mating availability to those women next to him? They seem to be uh, pretty excited by him right now. They're probably going to jump on him any minute. So that's good advice you can take from this is when you are on the tube, you should just spread your legs as wide as you can to signal like, hey, I'm a good mate to all of the women around you. Anyway, next slide. Worth mentioning kind of related to this is uh, neck musculature. And in this uh, chapter, they go into a lot of 
things that we covered in past chapters, right? Like physical traits that are desirable. So I'm not going into all of that in a lot of depth, but we're kind of going into that uh, a little bit. And something that wasn't mentioned in the past chapters was neck musculature, which I think is kind of worth a mention here. So we know that men with more muscular necks, that actually predicts like actual fighting ability, right? It predicts uh, the ability to withstand damage in physical combat. And there's been a couple of papers, I think, well, maybe just one. I think this might have been Mitch Brown's paper. But it looked at UFC fighters and said, well, who won? Who's winning their fights? Men with higher neck musculature, better, more muscled necks. It predicted more wins. We also know this is more attractive to women, more muscular rather than thinner necks. It signals more dominance to women and to other men. Higher ratings of masculinity and yeah more physical attractiveness there. So this does lead us to some hypotheses, right? As I mentioned, I think in the last slide, we should expect men to enhance physical traits as far as like gym activity and working out goes that are attractive to women. And we should expect women to focus more on physical traits that are attractive to men. And that's exactly what we see, right? Men train things like necks, men skip leg day, men do things like train chest and that kind of a thing. Women train their legs and they train their butts, right? So we'll get into that a little bit, but we do see kind of behavior as far as like working out, gym behavior, physical enhancement, physically, that reflects what traits are attractive to the opposite sex from the evolutionary point of view. Let's go on now to the next slide. In women, waist to hip ratio, right? The curvy thing, waist to hip ratio. And lumbar curvature as well. Um, across the literature, according to the authors in this article here, uh, waist to hip ratio is a sign of fertility or parity, right? So reproductive past, how many children have been had in the past, if children have been had in the past is not, and also just general fertility, you know, is this person going to be more or less fertile? So a ratio of 0.7, as mentioned in, I think, some of these past chapters in the evolutionary handbook we've covered, rated as most attractive pretty robustly across that. You even see that kind of in paintings of like desirable women across many thousands of years, very interesting paper on that, looked at all of these waist to hip ratios and paintings and said, ah, yeah, all of these women depicted as beautiful, kind of regardless of how large or thin they were, still had kind of this desirable waist to hip ratio. And again, the theme throughout this chapter, what have we talked about? Men and women engage in the behaviors to enhance physical traits that are attractive to the opposite sex. So what do we see here as far as female bodily enhancements that go to enhancing waist to hip ratio? Wearing corsets, girdles, lingerie, and also when taking pictures or selfies, gym pictures, that kind of a thing, engaging in specific poses that kind of enhance that waist to hip ratio, right? So a contrapposto kind of pose there. Lumbar curvature as well, right? So the curve to the back relative to the butt, that sort of a thing, can also signal health during pregnancy, more ability kind of to support perhaps a baby. So that would be kind of the evolutionary rationale for why that might have been selected is more attractive, right? Of course, that's not a conscious thing. And that's important to remember is the traits that men and women are attractive to or attracted to are not necessarily conscious awareness. Like I'm attracted to that because it signals the ability to carry a baby in your womb. These would be attractive predispositions or predispositions to be attracted to certain things because at some point in our evolutionary past, in our reproductive past, they were beneficial. So it just kind of happened almost by accident. Oh, these things are attractive because they facilitate this kind of reproductive fitness here. But it doesn't have to be the case. They can be, you know, sexual selection, attractive simply because they are. We don't always know, but those are, you know, good hypotheses, kind of an evolutionary rationale for like, why are some things going to be more attractive than others? So anyway, lumbar curvature. What else do we know? Men show a preference for this kind of lumbar curvature or lordosis in pictures, right? We also know women engage in poses to enhance this. And why are high heels attractive? High heels, really popular among women. Sometimes men say they don't care that much. We've actually asked about that in surveys that men are like, I don't care that much. But why has this kind of emerged as like a beauty thing, wearing high heels? Why do women like that? Is it to make them taller? Maybe, but men don't show a strong preference for tallness. Men do show more of a preference for lordosis. And what do we know? That when women wear high heels, it accentuates that curvature of the spine. It creates further lordosis. So perhaps that's kind of how that beauty trend emerged there. Anyway, next slide. Communication. What do we know? Talking, blah, blah. Humans have a very complex verbal ability, unlike many other animals, right? So we vocally and in text, we write, right? Communicate our mating intentions and mating fitness, desirability, things about ourselves. Like I'm a good mate for this reason. We just tell people I'm a good mate for this reason. We tell people I like you, right? So men, in kind of dating experiments, speed dating apps, we know that they signal traits verbally, again, theme throughout this video that are attractive to women, right? So men say, 
you know, these are my levels of income, this is my level of education. And communicating that kind of stuff also predicts to some extent which men actually get picked for a second date. So men communicate things that we know from the evolutionary point of view are valuable to women. Uh, things that can't just obviously be perceived, like facial attractiveness. You know, you can't, men don't typically go in front of someone nor do women and say, you know, I'm just really handsome. Look at me. Look how handsome I am. That's something, you know, people make the judgments themselves. So it's, you know, kind of a hard to fake signal, which means there's probably less verbal communication. Something like income, on the other hand, you know, education, people could lie about it, right? But you also can't detect it even if it's truthful. So you have to communicate that kind of verbally. And then, of course, you know, beyond that, men and women communicate affection verbally, right? I like you, I love you, all sorts of things people say to each other when they like each other to communicate like, hey, I like you, I want to be with you. And this occurs at all stages of relationship formation from like flirting at the very beginning, you know, approaching someone saying, hey, you caught my eye to like, you know, I want to marry you to just like day to day, like waking up, I love you in the morning or whatever the case may be. Warmth and kindness emerge across all of the evolutionary literature, you know, contrary to what, you know, some of this manosphere discourse will say, across all of the evolutionary literature is like some of the top most attractive behavioral traits, both for men and women to engage in, right? Men and women want partners who are like loving and kind and that kind of a thing. So a lot of the verbal communication that people engage in in relationships, again, it reflects that, you know, important to see. We seem to have evolved the kinds of behaviors to signal traits that are actually desirable to other people. So when we see people engage in dating behavior, you know, that's very common, like what do people try to do to attract a mate? Often they've kind of honed in, probably without knowing, on behaviors and things that are actually attractive to other people. So, you know, sometimes you hear kind of like, I guess, kind of niche counterculture things like, oh, don't be warm and kind. Women hate that. Yeah. Well, I mean, probably we've evolved, you know, this tendency to signal like, hey, I'm a nice guy. I want to be warm and kind and all of that. Because, you know, historically it has kind of worked, which is not to say, you know, being the typical nice guy, right, where someone is communicating uh, overt niceness, but they're actually not, and they're kind of a weak pushover and blah, blah, blah. But that's a whole other video. I've made videos on that. So humor production, what do we know? Humor production, the ability to be funny, it's actually associated with intelligence. We also know that humor is considered a very attractive trait, both to men and to women in the opposite sex. So probably particularly for men, we seem to think of that, but men also like funny women. Maybe, you know, I've heard uh, in all of the bowels of discourse online, like men don't care about this or that, but I mean, you probably enjoy being with a woman who's like fun to get along with and makes you laugh more than you do someone who just stares at you with like a resting bitch face, right? So humor production, valuable. Uh, this also kind of contributes intelligence to the production of art, science, literary works, written, music production, playing the guitar, whatever. All of these things communicate intelligence. Possibly, you know, intelligence evolved and all of these creative behaviors specifically related to intelligence evolved as a form of competition for mates. At least perhaps that had some role in it, right? These things like motivate men to compete for mates, they facilitate it, that kind of a thing. So intelligence, very important, even though some research, and I've mentioned this in past videos, indicates we don't necessarily select for intelligence at kind of zero contact, right? So in a speed dating study, a really good one, they, you know, had people rate intelligence of the partners they picked, but also measured their intelligence with Raven's matrices. Didn't actually predict who got picked, but that doesn't mean intelligence has no role. Potentially, it has much larger of a role for like, who's going to stay together after nine months? Who's going to stay together and get married? Who's not going to get divorced? Who's going to have higher fertility, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, going on now to the next slide. More on communication, the role of sound, okay? So the way people's voices sound specifically. The deep voices of men probably evolved to signal some degree of formidability. We know that they're actually associated with actual formidability. So men with deeper voices, larger on average. Men with deeper voices, uh, more dominant on average, behaviorally dominant, rated as more masculine, probably better fighters, etc., etc., etc. So these deep voices probably evolved to kind of intimidate rivals to communicate that. But they're also attractive to women. So these are also things that kind of evolved hand in hand is things that help men win contest competitions. So fights, uh, dominance competitions also kind of can become attractive to women over time. And again, because these are attractive to women, what do we see? Consistent pattern across this video. The opposite sex engages in behaviors that are attractive you know, to the opposite sex. So men lower their voices in these speed dating paradigms, right? You bring men into these speed dating paradigms, you measure their voice pitch and all of that. And you say, oh, now they're interacting interacting with a woman. What happened? Oh, they just dropped their voice pitch way down, right? 
So, you know, a, a lot of earlier hypotheses in evolutionary psychology were kind of like, this thing is related to health, this thing is not related to health, whatever the case may be. Low voices, probably not linked to health, kind of like high testosterone, probably not linked to health. A lot of these things like, oh, these are signs of health, have not actually panned out, but they can still be attractive for other reasons, right? Good reasons. So winning contest competitions, maybe they're just attractive for whatever uh, they can be. I'm surprised this chapter didn't talk about uh, vocal quality or sound in women at all, but we also know that more voices that are rated as more feminine in women, those are rated as more attractive. In fact, I think that's even more of a robust effect. Deeper voices, less feminine women, or less feminine voices in women, rated as less attractive. So, also here we see a correlation between uh, vocal attractiveness and physical attractiveness, not from the chapter, this is from my own research. This is from the, the uh, large sample of people rating uh, red-pilled influencers, right? So they rate their physical attractiveness and their vocal attractiveness. What do we see? When people view someone as physically attractive, they're also much more likely to view them as vocally attractive. When people view someone as uh, unattractive physically, they also rate their voice way, way down. So these things are too linked. These are not independent ratings. This is presented uh, concurrently, looking at a video of someone. So if someone says, oh, I don't like the way they look, they're probably also gonna rate their voice low, right? So these two, two things kind of go hand in hand. In Pat's research, this is independently related, right? So you can take the voice of someone, take the picture of someone, have different groups uh, rate them. People that are less attractive also get rated lower with vocal attractiveness, right? So, you know, as I mentioned in some past videos, there's kind of this co-variability of desirability due to assortative mating, where attractive traits probably cluster in individuals, right? So yeah, individuals more physically attractive also kind of end up with voices that are more attractive on average. Anyway, next slide. Tactical courtship. So tactical in this case meaning touch and not the other use of tactical. Two big purposes for this, okay? The consolidation of pair bonds, right? We know that touching a lot facilitates bonding. There's a lot of research on the role of hormones in this like oxytocin, right? So back rubs, the length of hugs, you know, these are all things that facilitate bonding in a relationship. If you're in a romantic relationship, you should do these things. You should touch a lot and a long, for a long time, right? Uh, cuddling after sex, also important kind of to facilitate that pair bond. There's kind of a lot on this. So those are, you know, hormonal mechanisms. Why did these things kind of evolve? But there's also, you know, maybe more explicit things that people recognize off the bat. So just demonstrating affection, right? Communicating to the partner like, I still like you, right? Communicating commitment to that partner, communicating positive emotion. We know that's something that uh, has a big role in like, who's going to stay together over a long period of time? Well, people that have a positive emotion in their relationship over people that have negative emotion in their relationship. Pretty intuitive and that's the way that it plays out. So behaviors, touch, shift over time. So an interesting one they mentioned here in this, we know that men touch more early in courting, right? So when they're flirting with a woman, when they're just starting to date, when the relationship is young, men touch more. What happens? This shifts over time. Men touch less in older relationships. Women begin to touch more in older relationships. So, you know, that could even reflect uh, sex differences perhaps in you know short and long-term orientation. This is not from the chapter. This is just me speculating right now in the moment. Men touch more to secure the relationship early on. Women having a higher orientation toward long-term mating and pair bonding touch more to facilitate the relationship extended over time. But just a guess, right? Effective touch, it occurs most in romantic relationships, much less with family, friends, children. So yeah, most of the time you're giving affectionate touch to someone, which is of course not always sexual, right? You can, you know, you can hug your child, you can hug your mother, you can hug your wife, but this kind of touch occurs much more in romantic relationships than it does in other contexts, okay? Another interesting point they mentioned this, touch like this, it's less common for people who have suffered a past infectious disease. So someone who has uh, had a disease in the past, they engage in this kind of touch less going forward. Adaptation perhaps, you know, unconscious here to not spread the disease or whatever, I don't know, maybe, but they mentioned that, I thought it was kind of interesting. Anyway, next slide, olfactory health, scent, smells, right? So we know smell is a re reliable cue of bacterial load. People that have more bacteria on them smell worse. That's what produces body odor, okay? Bad odors further, they signal bad health in that sense, not just necessarily because the person is unclean, but also perhaps because they have other issues going on internally. So there was one experiment, it ejected an endotoxin into women and it had people rate the attractiveness of these women, their appearance and their smell, I believe both, resulted in lower ratings for both, okay? 
So emanating a bad odor, yeah, gets you rated lower in attractiveness. Good odors, on the other hand, have been linked to better immune function, okay? So like facial attractiveness kind of has not that immunocompetence uh, handicap theory, immunocompetence handicap theory, I should say, uh, hasn't really panned out. But some of this linking of odors to health actually has, okay? So that's kind of something that we see there. So selecting partners who have good odors could be adaptive in the sense that it's actually selecting for people that have better immune function, better health, right? And not just better immune function, but even better health in the moment, like, wow, they smell bad, maybe they got a disease, okay? So what's the pattern we've seen, again, as I mentioned throughout this? If people find something attractive, they try to enhance it, right? Or I should say, if the opposite sex finds something attractive in you, you know, they're going to try to enhance that, and you're going to try to enhance the things that the opposite sex finds as attractive, right? Or you conceal its antithesis. So, People who smell bad, what do they do? They try to cover it up, which I guess is everyone smells bad occasionally, right? So people wear perfume and cologne. So they try to enhance the good smells or they try to cover up the bad smells, deodorant, right? Some recent commercials I've seen now that I have a television, whole body deodorant, that's apparently a thing now. Some people smell so bad uh, in you know 2024, it's not sufficient to just deodorize their pits. They gotta use a whole freaking body deodorant. Anyway, next slide. Odors, personality, behavior. So smells can actually communicate personality traits and behavior acutely as well. How? Well, when people are fearful or stressed, they sweat more, they emanate an odor, right? They emit an odor in that sense. Neurotic individuals also have been rated lower as far as uh, their smells are concerned, right? In this uh, research by Sorokoska, I think I may have said that right. Individuals who score higher in neuroticism are rated as having less attractive smells than individuals who are rated lower in neuroticism. So neuroticism broadly, an undesirable trait, and here we see again a co-variability, right? Where bad traits kind of cluster together, black pill, whatever. Masculinity and dominance predicted by odors. Women who say a man has a more masculine odor also tend to rate uh, his physical appearance and that sort of a thing as higher in masculinity and more behaviorally dominance. Uh, same with facial masculinity. More masculine faces associated with more masculine body odors, probably related to testosterone, although uh, not in this chapter, but in you know some of my big uh, literature reviews on facial masculinity. Facial masculinity is not that closely related to like serum testosterone. It's much more closely related to something like prenatal testosterone probably, but that could be one explanation for it, right? Higher facial masculinity, perhaps higher testosterone, uh, androstatinone as well. Maybe I've said that wrong. I don't know. I'm not. A hormone expert, but that could explain, you know, these more masculine odors. So this effect actually covered up by cologne or deodorant. So when more masculine men wear cologne or deodorant and less masculine men, then kind of that effect completely disappears. So it kind of raises a question, you know, for you as a man, are you someone who's gotten a lot of feedback from women, you know, that women like the way that you smell when you're not wearing deodorant or something like that? Probably a good sign, right? And if not, well, probably a bad sign in that case. And for men who are maybe lower in masculinity or something like that, you can boost those perceptions up just by wearing a cologne or a fragrance that's more masculine, right? You can boost kind of perceptions of dominance and masculinity that way. So going on to the next slide. Gustatory courtship. So this is food, right? But it's not just food. We know primates trade food for sex just straight off, right? We tend to think of this as like long-term resource provisioning behavior, but actually this is one of like the really well replicated things for short term mating behavior is that people exchange short term mating opportunities, sex, for resources. And we see this in primates, just a direct trade of food for sex. But we also see this in something like kissing, right? So uh, gustatory in this sense, taste, not just eating, also tasting your partner in that sense. I'm surprised in this chapter they didn't mention oral sex now that I think about it in the moment, but they didn't. Anyway, kissing, what do we know? It enhances pair bonding, right? Uh, it probably also might allow for the assessment of mate quality, right? So an assessment of health. But there's you know, been some uh, question about this, and I think the authors of this chapter actually are kind of proponents of this hypothesis we'll talk about, this sebum detection hypothesis. So there's kind of a question, like why would kissing evolve if it facilitates pair bonding, if pair bonding is already like robustly facilitated by tactile things? You know, a lot of animals don't kiss, they don't need to, even though they touch a lot and that sort of a thing. So we know Touch across animals, very well uh, linked to pair bonding behavior. Animals are perfectly capable of that, but most animals don't kiss. 
Why did humans kiss? So maybe it's not a pair bonding thing. Maybe that's not the best explanation. Maybe it's an assessment of mate health, particularly through the role of sebum, which is excreted kind of around that. So sebum, it's detected by taste, not smell. So past hypotheses have said, ah, yeah, kissing lets you smell your partner better, and therefore it facilitates kind of this assessment of health, but maybe not. Maybe it's not smell. Maybe it's actually through taste, you know, because you can smell someone without kissing them, right? But if it's kind of like, oh, you're getting additional information through kissing, then something's going on with taste, right? And so that could be through sebum, which is secreted more around the lips. It's secreted more in the phase of human beings' life when they're like reproductively fertile. So like, you know, like early teens, or I should say late teens, like mid twenties, that kind of a thing. It happens more when people kiss, they begin to secrete more. It happens when people are aroused. So there's some interesting evidence here for this. And I think this is probably something that the authors, um, they discuss a lot in this chapter. So I think maybe it's their thing, but I'm not really sure, but interesting nonetheless. So courtship feeding, as we mentioned, uh, a role in like providing for offspring and mates, right? You're feeding your offspring, you're, you're feeding your mates, that kind of a thing. So they're not becoming, uh, you know, affected by malnutrition or whatever. So kind of an evolutionary purpose for why that might be. They mention a study that looked, I think it was at like a dating show across a bunch of different TV uh, series. And they found, ah, when couples shared food on a date, they were much more likely to go on a second date on these shows. 93% of the couples who shared food with each other versus only 43 who didn't. So, you know, that of course raises a question. What is the direction of the relationship? Are people more likely to flirt and share food when they like each other? Or does sharing food actually increase liking? In which case you could be like, oh yeah, you know, pick up tip or whatever, or share food. But we don't know. It's just something observed, right? Observational methodology there. But interesting nonetheless. Anyway, going on now. One more slide. They just talk about some future research. And this is kind of like limitations. Where are there gaps in the knowledge? What do we not know from past research, okay? So, faces. Uh, a lot is, you know, a lot of research on faces is about rating faces. Who's attractive, who's not. Human raters, that's good because it has ecological validity, right? It applies to real world scenarios, but it doesn't get into a lot of the details about like, why is this face attractive and this isn't? So they say, you know, we could use more geometric morphometric analyses of this, you know, looking at measurements of facial features independently with algorithms, that kind of a thing. Research on auditory cues of attractiveness. There's actually kind of like fairly little of this. So uh, they say, you know, future research could explore like what's being said, how is it being said, that kind of a thing. Also more linguistic analyses, right? So what kind of speech is being used in like these speed dating paradigms? Basically, you know, if you wanted to say it in a practical way, like who is good at flirting and why? What sort of things are people saying that get a second date that people who don't get a second date are not saying? Right? Are they talking more about the other person? Are they talking more about themselves? What word choices and styles are they using? And what sorts of those things are actually linked to you know, uh, fitness enhancing traits that might be personality traits or behavioral traits? What do extroverted people say that introverted people don't say specifically, right? What do men say you know, that are more physically attractive that men who are less physically attractive don't say? That kind of a thing. So. Touch. We see really robust trends with touch. We know, you know, that it has this big role in like relationship formation, maintenance and all of that. But what information is communicated by touch and how does that signal mate value, right? The location, the timing of touch, that kind of thing in relationship formation. Obviously, you know, if you're touching someone on a first date, you're probably touching them very differently than you're touching your wife, that kind of thing. So smells, there's actually pretty little on like the chemical composition of odors and what makes odors attractive or unattractive. So more uh, chemical analysis, you know, could be beneficial. And then taste, kissing. Why? Why don't we evolve kissing? We don't really know. So this sebum detection hypothesis that they talk about. Anyway, one more slide here. Let's go on. So some final thoughts, my own here, not from the chapter. Uh, as I mentioned throughout this, kind of see the trend. What's going on here? Put the puzzle together. What people enhance is what the opposite sex finds attractive, which should also tell you kind of about the role of, or I guess the evolution of attractive features and behaviors, right? Much of this is not conscious or deliberate, both as far as knowing what the opposite sex finds attractive and one's own enhancement of it. It's not like people go through life just thinking like, I gotta maximize this, I gotta maximize this. Some is conscious and deliberate. Some people realize that, they can come to that and be like, okay, this is what I need to work on. But a lot of it is just people doing things completely unconsciously, not necessarily realizing like, oh yeah, I'm doing this to enhance my attractiveness to the opposite sex. Like lowering a voice in an interaction with a woman in a speed date. Probably not a lot of men are knowing like that they're doing that. Like, oh, I got to lower my voice now. It's just something that kind of happens. So given this, that people seem to engage in all of this mating behavior instinctually, and that this mating behavior evolved to reflect the romantic preferences of the opposite sex, 
how much of typical courtship behavior do you think is like getting it wrong, right? Like, oh, men are making all the mistakes doing these things that all of the men do to attract a woman. Probably not a lot, right? It's probably not the case that, you know, people are just making like uh, terrible mistakes when they're engaging in courtship behavior, right? So another way to put that, you know, in kind of manosphere terms, a lot of, you know, so-called blue-pilled behavior, probably it's evolved behavior, it works, it probably worked in an ancestral environment, it probably still does, right? You know, so like leading with your wallet or whatever you want to call, you know, there's a lot of reasons why you probably don't want to do things like that. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't work, right? It doesn't mean that, you know, people don't just instinctively go for these behaviors, learn them from others, engage in them because they figured out like, hey, this kind of works a little bit. It also probably means you don't need, you know, the 10 hot tips, PUA, PDF or whatever secrets to figure out like the nature of women. Probably, you know, a lot of that stuff you can just figure out by interacting with women yourself and acting normal and, you know, thinking like, I like this. This is probably what they would like also. Anyway, it's not that complicated, but... That's it for this video. Chapter 6, Human Intersexual Courtship, Oxford Handbook of Evolutionary Psychology, and Romantic Relationships. Slides are done, okay? So, like, subscribe, hit the bell. We have a Patreon. Join the Patreon. Subscribe. Uh, help support the project. Next video, Chapter 7, coming up very soon.